Hello, beloved. I am Pastor Victor Resendiz. Welcome to this weekly series called God is Love, conversations on compassion, justice, and spirituality. Each week, we will explore our role as Christian believers in today's national dialogue around race and racism. We'll be joined by Liz Peterson, Assistant Director of Houston Coalition Against Hate, a network of organizations, institutions, and individuals committed to preventing and addressing all forms of hate in our community. We invite you to listen for the transforming Word of God, as together we seek to fully embody the great commandment to love God and love neighbor. Hello, everyone. Welcome back to another God is Love conversation. We're back with Liz. Welcome, Liz. Thank you. Glad to be here. It's good to see you again. Uh, we've had some great feedback already from people that have tuned in. So I'm hoping that they also share this space with others uh, and, you know, can also bring, bring in their questions and their comments. Uh, thus far, some of the comments that we've uh, had is that there was a lot of clarity to some confusion and we'll touch a little bit on that in the next conversation. Um, uh, and, and everybody's just kind of, the, the, the people that we've heard back from has just been that this is a space that uh, can provide some guidance in some of these topics. So I'm glad that we were able to put this together. So uh, this morning, there are a couple of things that I wanna cover with you, Liz. Uh, and I know you, you brought another education piece uh, to us, uh, but first off, on the top of my list, I wanted to talk a little bit about the awareness of compassion. Uh, last week we touched on that part of learning this, um, this, this topic of racism uh, can ruffle a lot of feathers, can make us feel uncomfortable, but also that we can lean in towards our faith. So as Christian believers, this, is a, this, this has to be a fabric of our own testimony as we're growing into our faith. Uh, so this is not separate from it whatsoever. And so when I talk about being aware of compassion is what are those things that move me that are aligned to God's heart? And what are those things that, that break my heart that align to God's heartbreaking as well? Well, injustice has to be on top of it. I mean, there is nothing in scripture that does not move away from injustice, that that is a, a main ingredient that God um, manifested his heart being a part of uh, that his part his heart was being a part of that any injustice if you look through scripture many of the prophets what they were bringing to the table were uh, typically that the injustice that was being done so this is not again this is not separate from our from from us growing in our faith um, and, and so I just want to invite everyone this morning that when I talk about awareness of compassion is that tendency to be in your own state of mind, in your own uh, prompting of your heart. And what are those things that break your heart? What are those things that move you to pray, to intervene for others, to lament for a situation? Uh, and so, so we're invited by that. But as you know, Liz, because we're in this inner battle with ourselves, so to speak. There's also resistance uh, based on the way we grew up, uh, what we were told, what we were modeled. So many things may find us in a crossroads where I could be resisting that. And, and compassion can be something that I'm fighting just based on, you know, unfortunately, there's a lot of uh, toxic patriotism out there. Uh, there's a lot of, um, toxic tradition, so to speak, you know, because I've heard this before, you know, people always say, well, this is the way we grew up, you know, Uncle Bob, and that's the way he expressed himself. These things that were just kind of normal for us to hear in our environment. And so all of a sudden we become like, well, that's just the way it is. Uh, so when something like this, like racism confronts us, this is where we truly answer the question, where, where am I going to step towards? Mm -hmm. You see, to, to really genuinely make a change, to genuinely make a transformation within myself, because it's got to start there. And that's something that we talked about last week. Um, so speaking of resistance, um, I know that one of the major, I guess, if we want to call it a title or topic that we hear a lot, especially it's become more of a catchphrase, 
is this white privilege and the resistance to that. Could you give us an, some education on that, what that represents, what that means? Yes, absolutely. In fact, I have a slideshow to share with you. If you give me a moment to share my screen. So yes, I would say that of the sandpaper words that are out there about um, race and racism, privilege is right up there with something that we just want to resist with all our might because it works, it awakens in us um, a feeling like we aren't who we thought we were. We didn't earn what we believe we earned, what we believe, what we remember working hard for. And so as humans, our instinct is to preserve our self image to any cost. So the important thing I think is to break down what do we mean by white privilege? Because once again, you can have an incorrect idea of, white, of what white privilege is and you can resist that and then you can refuse to be part of a, a conversation that you might ultimately be able to agree with and be able to ac accommodate your understanding to. So what I'm gonna do is we're gonna look at the definition of, of what is white privilege. Now you can have privilege in a lot of different areas. In fact, you can have privilege, some parts of your identity can be privileged while other parts of your identity are marginalized. So you can, so, so privilege covers the spectrum of, of your race, your gender, your income and education level, um, the first language that you spoke or the nation in which you were born, your ability, both physical and mental, um, your occupation, your status, your, your sexual identity or your gender identity, all of these things are um, ways in which our society offers some benefits, some built-in advantages for some identities, while other identities do not have that advantage. Mm -hmm. So if you um, are white and you have white skin privilege, the idea is that it's an, a built-in invisible advantage based on one's race and separate from one's level of income or effort. So it does not mean that you have never struggled. It does not mean that you and your ancestors did not work hard to get where you are. I know a lot of people in Memorial Drive in particular have worked their entire lives to build the, the comfort, the situation that their families have enjoy now. And that there is nothing wrong with that. There is a lot to be proud of about that. The thing is that it's important to understand that some of what we are able to accomplish as white people is easier for us to accomplish because of societal forces that offer benefits to us. So for example, just to look at my own case, because I never want to make it seem like I'm better or I'm not affected by these things. I was fortunate that my grandparents both went to college my maternal grand grandmother and grandfather, and then my parents met at college. And my grandparents, when they died, left me the money that I needed that I don't have any student loan debt for my undergraduate uh, education. That is an enormous privilege that I, that I got, not by the color of my skin, but by a lot of structurally racist practices that allowed these things to happen. So because Black people and Latino people and other people of color are less likely to have intergenerational wealth, they have less opportunity to pass on a, free, a, a paid for college education to their children. Mm -hmm. So their children end up with, with debt at the age of 20, 21, mm -hmm. whereas I didn't. So, Again, I, read, I mentioned this last week that I was able to take unpaid internships to get my journalism jobs. This is important because it, thinking about white privilege reinforces the myth of meritocracy. It makes me think that because I went to Northwestern and I took unpaid internships, 
I'm more qualified or I'm better. I'm the reason that I got a good job at the Associated Press out of college is because I was better than the other candidates of color who did not maybe get those jobs. When really a large part of it, I did work hard. You know, I did work my behind off at these internships, but I had them because in part because of white privilege. And that's mm -hmm. what we're talking about. Just to understand that working hard and being good isn't always enough. Isn't the only reason why we have succeeded. Sure, sure. So the privilege, it manifests in a lot of different ways. I just gave you a strong economic idea, but it also manifests in the idea that our normal is normal, is the actual definition of normal. When really, I mean, I, I mean it's so so silly, right? But I, I had to wake up to the idea that just because what I think is normal, because I've seen it all my life, someone else who grew up across the freeway from where I live now, maybe, had entirely different experiences of what is normal, of what looks normal, of what sounds normal, of what tastes normal. So we as white people set the normal in the United States, and that can come in major ways, but it also comes in little tiny ways. Like if you Google facial beauty on Google, you will come up with this image. I didn't make this up. This is showing you that facial beauty happens to look a lot. I mean, I'm not saying that I look like these models, but they have, they have similar skin tone, similar features in terms of the way that their, their eyes, nose and mouth are structured. And so, Google is telling me that my face is beautiful, as opposed to the many ways that God made faces. It also shows up in books and magazines and television shows. It shows up in school curriculums where, where white history or the history of uh, Eurocentric, um, basically men is, is prioritized over the history of uh, black and Latino and other um, people of color. Can, can, I, can I give you a quick parenthesis in that? You're, it's so interesting because one of the common um, questions that, uh, for instance, Latinos, you know, we have all sorts of uh, mixed races because of our history, right? Um, so it's so funny to hear when, when we get approached as a Mexican, I'm telling you, uh, in Mexico, there are many, many different shades and colors and ethnicities and uh, features, right? But if we get someone that's very light-skinned, people are, are, are <laughs> their reaction to them is like, you're Mexican? It's almost like they've already have a label according to what was, has, has been told to us what a Mexican should look like. And so if there's someone that looks like you, for instance, it's unheard of when being from Mexico, there's, a, there's certain regions in Mexico that were uh, mixed by European blood. So there, so th there are going to be people that have your features that are Mexican. It's, just, it's, um, it's really interesting how we get convinced on what we are told versus um, really becoming more, um, and I'm going to say it, I guess, educated or becoming a little bit more aware that that's not the case. Mm -hmm. uh, anyways, I didn't want to interrupt you that, but, but it just reminds me of, sort of that that confusion so much so there's a uh, there so there's this huge uh display in the national anthropology uh museum in mexico city that says do you want to know what a mexican looks like and it has a multi multi faces of different mesoamerican looking all the way to europe euro looking individuals and everything in between that's what a mexican looks like i just i found that so um I find that as a, it's sort of like, wow, well, yeah, I've, I've been faced with that question before. Oh, really? You're Mexican? You know, depending on the shade of color you're in or what have you. So anyways, go ahead. No, no. Thank you for, thank you for adding that. It's really important to think about um, because we, we, we also, as the dominant culture group in the United States, get to set what a white, what a Mexican person looks like. And that's something to really um, to think about. Correct. So another, another way that we can explore the idea of white privilege is the power of the benefit of the doubt. 
And so this comes about in a lot of different ways. This comes about, we hear it a lot in police interactions and in the way that certain individuals are sentenced as the picture des describes Brock Turner, convicted of felony sexual assault, judge sentenced him to six months in prison because we think about, well, he's a good boy who, had, who made a mistake, um, who has a, a good future. Um, and whereas someone like Willie Simmons was sentenced to life without parole for stealing $9, has been in prison since 1982. Um, this also shows up in school discipline. Um, there are study after study shows that teachers watch black children more and they interpret the, uh, the facial expressions, the behaviors of black children as defiance, as problematic, much more often than they would um, take the same or similar facial expressions or behavior of white students. So they, even as young as kindergarten, start um, targeting these students for, uh, for staying in from recess is, is maybe how it starts or putting your name on the board. Um, but then it escalates, stepping out of the classroom, being sent down to the principal's office, um, possibly losing your magnet seat if you're mm -hmm. in Houston ISD and you have too many discipline um, mm -hmm. concerns. And this is what we talk about, it could be a whole other talk, but about the school to prison pipeline. And you think, well, that is, that, that is something that doesn't happen here or that doesn't happen to people that I know. And I have to tell you that I have two friends personally that I have watched in real life, in real time, this happened to their kindergarten age mm -hmm. children where their children, one woman was a teacher in the same school and pulled out her child from that kindergarten because she could not get the teacher to, to treat him as, a, as any other child mm. who's five years old sure. and does not have perfect behavior. Mm. And another friend of mine had her child um, you know, told that she was probably below average academically and you know, just perceived as um, being very disruptive because she would move around the classroom or she would uh, not um, be following along with, with exactly what the teacher would say. Well, it turns out this child was actually probably advanced for her age and had come from a Montessori preschool where mm -hmm. kids do not have uh, the same kind of practice, sitting still, doing one thing with the whole group, following along. Montessori encourages kids to move around, to, to, to do their um, work at their pace, at their, determining their level of interest. Sure. So just to automatically assume that this beautiful little five-year-old girl is a below average troublemaker mm. rather than an above average, no, like normal um, child who just had, who's just adjusting to kindergarten like every kid is. It's just Correct. astonishing to me. Sure, sure. So uh, the power of accumulation just goes back to what I was talking about with my ability to get uh, my degree with no debt. Um, if you see this median net worth of edu by education level of head of household, you'll notice that white households with no bachelor's degree tend to have a higher median net worth than both black and Hispanic households that do have degrees. So that just gives you a sense that through systemic racism, which we don't have time to get further into today, mm -hmm. um, white people have been able to establish a good deal of economic um, comfort that uh, black and Hispanic people have not. And I just put this up because there's nothing that you, like there's nothing that I can do about the fact that I have white privilege. Um, mm -hmm. There's, you know, I'm, I can't change the color of my skin. Um, I can't choose to have been born to other parents. Um, I can't change the situation that I have received my college education. Mm -hmm. So what I can do is I can teach other white folks about this, which I'm doing right now. I can listen to and amplify the voices of black people, indigenous people and people of color. I can be actively anti-racist and I can confront racial injustices even when it's uncomfortable because generally I have the privilege to get away with doing that where somebody who is black or brown skinned sure. or has less economic privilege or educational privilege is gonna have deeper repercussions. Correct, correct, correct. Wow. Yeah. So I don't know, that kind of goes into that, that, that quote that, that 
uh, you and I were talking about before we started sure. filming. I really love this the, uh, by Ijeoma Olowu. The beauty of anti-racism is that you don't have to pretend to be free of racism to be an anti-racist. Anti-racism is the commitment to fight racism wherever you find it, including in yourself, and it's the only way forward. Mm -hmm. You know, that quote is very powerful in the sense I like, I like that it says including in yourself, and that's the starting point. So now I want to guide people as a pastor that that is a starting point. You know, when, when, when we get these questions of, well, what can I do? Well, first of all, is, is finding out <laughs> your own biases, as we talked about last week. Well, how do I do that? It, well, the beauty of being a Christian is that we can bring all that in the presence of God. And if we're, and we're, and if we're coming from a, a, a place where we genuinely want to be transformed, where we want God's love to really move, it will happen, you know, but, but if I, if, but if I come into the situation already resisting um, or convinced with my ideology, that that's going to be very difficult. And I think that's where a lot of folks are stuck in nowadays. Um, this type of work, you and I both know, you get a lot of questions and you get a lot of invitations. Sometimes what I call argue to argue, which I try to stay away from, uh, but in some cases, uh, there are genuine people with different points of view that are willing to have conversation. And I don't mind that. I don't mind having conversations. Um, but coming into a, a, a discussion like this, already made up your mind of what you think and how wrong you are, Liz, then that's not, that's not going to do any benefit for anybody. Um, and especially in, in, the, in the Christian spaces, because we are called to evolve. We are called to continue to grow. We are called to continue to uh, deepen our faith. And so if my faith is calling me this way, th there's a trust factor that I can't, I don't have to trust you, Liz. I don't have to trust Victor, but I can trust God. And God can guide me and God can teach me through his love and his compassion of what he wants me to uh, see in myself, what he wants me to uh, maybe gently release that maybe has been an obstacle to see beyond uh, others. Um, and also what I talked to you about, you know, offline, um, there is something what I call familiar spaces. Familiar spaces are safe and they're great, but they are also limited. So if, if I spend my time years and years in this limited space, it's very difficult for me to see anything outside of that or for me to be able to embrace anything new. My grandfather used to tell me this uh, um, sort of wise, wise tale about, he said that uh, when the Great Wall was built, it, it was uh, with the intention to protect uh, those inside the wall. And that one day two gentlemen were walking within this, this uh, uh, protected space and they looked up in the, in the sky and there was a plane that passed through. And then each one looked at each other and said, what is that? Well, civilization had moved on. <laughs> And they were still, you know, confined into this space. And so that, you know, he, you know, he gave me that as a reason. I remember he told me, he goes, never, uh, he goes, have an open mind to continue to learn and continue to evolve. He goes, because the, the world's always evolving. So, th so I, I say the same thing with our faith. You know, if, if, you know, Richard Rohr, the Franciscan priest says that if the gospel that we were taught in our early years is still what we are you know, believing in, and, and that's the same story, so to speak, uh, that we, we were taught in Sunday school uh, when we were kids, and then now as adults, it's the same thing that we're, that we're sitting on. It's like we haven't deepened our faith. We haven't evolved in our faith. So, so I think the invitation is that, is that part of this education work that you're bringing to us, Liz, is also in hand to part of deepening um, what is the gospel inviting me to learn? What is scripture inviting me to learn about this? And, 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 it, and if it does confront me to gently say, God, here I am, here I am. And, and, and in some case, if I do have to confess, well, that's, that's great. I, that means breakthrough. That means growth. Uh, and in some cases, uh, it's just aha moments, something that was already inside of us. This designed compassion just kind of realizes, oh, okay, yeah, this makes sense. Why this breaks uh, this breaks God's heart, you know? So anyways, 
Um, but, but speaking of this particular... Um, uh, uh, well, before we move on, I wanted to, I wanted to just okay. touch on what you said. Please, I wanted please. to make sure that yes. you um, got out, you know, the fullness of your thought. But yes. it, also, it also struck me the idea of having a grace for ourselves mm -hmm. and for others. Because mm -hmm. I know that something that happens when you become awakened to racial injustice is that you start to notice how deeply problematic everyone around you now seems and how much you desire to inform them about how wrong they are. So as uh, I did it, you know, I, I have done it too. And um, I just wanted to lift up in what you were saying to, to have grace with yourself, but then to also have grace with other people that they, they can learn, um, they can change, and they're much more likely to in the course of a conversation than to be sort of, to, nobody wants to feel attacked. And so um, something that I am embracing right now is trying the, the, the concept, it was brought up on Twitter by, a, by a, actually some, I'm not sure who, but normalize changing your opinion when you're presented with new information. Something mm. in our culture, we are just bound and determined to prove that we aren't wrong. And so, so can we just normalize the idea that we don't already know everything sure. and that when we get information that it's okay, there's nothing. And, and I think that, again, I think good liberal, quote unquote, progressive racial justice warriors do this inadvertently, but we, we, we cancel people. You talk about the cancel sure. culture. You know, we cancel people and, you know, God created everyone, every single sure. person in, in the universe. And God has gifted everyone with the potential to, to fully embrace God's humanity, Amen. the humanity. Yeah. Um, and um, I just encourage us to both remain open to changing our opinion and remain open to each other. Sure. Yeah. It's, it's almost like <clears throat> we cannot choose and pick who's, who's got the image of God, right? Absolutely. Yeah. Thank you so much for saying that. But I wanted to also lead us into this resource you found uh, from Ijeoma Alu uh, and tell us a little bit about that. Well, the, the, resor the resource was um, created by, um, well, gosh, his name is escaping me right now. His first name is Philippe. Yeah. And um, he, he pulled out that quote just to, just to start out um, the conversation. But what he created, and I shared it in our MDUMC Grapple group on Facebook, which I encourage everyone to join if you haven't already. Um, just put in the search box, MDUMC Grapple. And um, the I just found his name. I just found his name. Philippe Lazaro. Yes. Thank uh you. And, and also, I want to let everyone know that they've been asking me about the video you sent uh, that they couldn't hear last week. Yeah, I talked about that. Yeah, so I'm, we're just going to post that on the comment area. I'm going to put, post the link of that oh, video. Oh, good idea. And okay. any other resources, we'll post them on the comment area so people can look, look out for them. So go ahead. Okay, okay great. Um, so, so this resource that he created, I think is, I, I just came upon it today. The Spirit brings me these things, and I think that, that, that God wants me to share it with you all. Um, it's like, where do I start when, I, when I'm educating myself? And there's so many lists out there. There's one list on Memorial Jive's website, and it's good, you know? But it's, it's, it's like, how do I pick of, of what to start? And what I like about this is that he breaks it down by the variety of topics topics that you could get into and what you want to understand. And then he'll lead you um, to, to different resources. And if that resource doesn't work for you, if you leave that conversation confused or disagreeing, you're, what does that mean? That means that you're human. And to keep, to keep trying, I really liked one of our, one of our Memorial Jive members uh, posted a comment on on this when I posted it earlier, say this is a great roadmap for a lifetime of work. Mm -hmm. And I just love when she said that. Yep. So they talk about, so this is the race, privilege and bias um, roadmap, but he also has history. Um, I also like it when you, when you get into this, that it um, has, has uh, different 
formats. So some mm -hmm. of it can be video, some of it can sure. be audio, um, mm -hmm. some of it can be fun stuff, like yeah. enjoyable reading. Um, I think Into the Spider-Verse is in here somewhere. And that's intentional because um, there's lots of ways to interact with, um, with this work and all of them add something to your understanding. So there's history, sure. there's faith-based, um, the podcast truths table you're, you'll see here at the bottom. I listened to that one. It's fantastic. And it comes from a, a more, um, conservative, uh, theological perspective than what I typically follow, but mm -hmm. I find it fascinating because it, 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 it helps me understand how other people see the gospel. And that's just, that's just so, in, so enriching. Sure. Um, and then he talks about environment and housing, policing and mass incarceration, understanding the current moment, school and work, and then the black joy. And um, that is not an afterthought. It, if we only, um, as white people, dig into black pain, we, we still have a flawed understanding of what it is to be black in the United States. Mm -hmm. And, um, well, while it's incredibly important for us to gain that understanding, I encourage mm -hmm. us to also expand to, to enjoying not just the pain, but all the beautiful things mm -hmm. that Black culture mm -hmm. brings to, mm -hmm. to mm -hmm. the United States. And, um, and expand and challenge yourself. This is not maybe the movie that you would normally choose to see on a Friday right. or Saturday night, but um, right. you'll, you'll yeah. learn so much and the full, yeah. full list of resources. Yeah. I like that you're mentioning about the joy because that's part of uh, the resisting part. Um, because from my experience, people can be resisting immediately. They'll go in and just, if they see something they're not familiar with, they'll immediately go into their critical mind and judge it and they don't understand it and then they get away from it. And, and that's not, you're not opening, you're, you're only, you know, you're only limiting yourself from experiencing. And I love the fact that you, you know, like you said, this resource provides us an invitation to the joy, the joyful part of, of the black community. And if I can gently challenge our listeners, our viewers, if there's a resource on here that you, that you strongly disagree with and you do not believe should be on here, and you use that as an excuse not to look at any of the other resources that are on here, I just hope that you'll sit with God and pray about why that is. That's, yeah, that's great advice. That is great advice. Yeah. So uh, do you have any other slides or is this? Nope, oh, that's my last slide. Okay. I'm gonna stop sharing. Yeah, thank you so much for all that information, Liz. That's, I think, again, this is what's so, wonderful about this space that we're we're getting an opportunity to guide people through the resources the many resources that are out there and i love what you just said you're so right you cannot move away from especially if god is luring you towards this because this is this is it's an inner restlessness that's not going to leave you alone so if you're already curious it's not because all of a sudden it, it came out of you no god is calling you towards this but you're right if if something is just not you're not ready to engage in there's so many others that will gently walk you through your own journey, through your own path. Um, so the next thing I want to touch on, and, 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 and I'll, I'll love your, I would love your feedback too and your personal experience. You know, in, in some of my teachings, what I talk about is whenever we are growing and there are things that we're not familiar with and we're resisting in, in, in our faith, whether it's our own personal behavior, our own, you know, things that we're battling, whatever, or in this case, you know, some, out, some outer uh, topics like this, you know, racism. I, I try to invite the folks to consider this. What, is, what has culture taught me or what is culture influencing me in? And what is the light of scripture telling me or inviting me to go into? Uh, Jerry Weber is one of my contemplative teachers. You know him as well. And one of the things that he teaches about resistance is that that very resistance is the invitation towards something that God is trying to teach you or God is trying to grow you in. So every time we resist, is it's it's an invitation. So so rather than going back to uh, hiding 
in, in, within, you know, the resistance of whatever reason why, you know, it causes us, you know, anger, confusion, or, you know, discomfort, whatever, but, but that's going to be the actual breakthrough through our growth, right? Is that to walk into that, whatever we're resisting. So the resistance is accompanied by the gospel, by the word of God. So what is the word of God telling me? So to make it as simple as, but yet profound, because we say this so much in our Christian uh, circles, well, love God and love neighbor. Well, that's wonderful. And we can make t-shirts out of that. And it sounds great. Yeah. But the application, it's totally different. The application of it is completely different. And so, so the application to generally apply it is that I really need to be, first of all, in touch with God, because God is doing in me, and then manifesting what he's doing in me, which is transforming through his love, and then manifesting that out to others in a genuine way, not in a way that I select who and who I choose. Tell me a little bit about your personal journey, your, your personal faith experience. How has that evolved from the moment of your realization that you told us about last week? And, and you know, you know you, and just something pivotal that's been in your life that you said, you know, this practice has really brought me into God's presence and has moved things around and shifted things around that maybe at one point I would have resisted. Yeah, um, what immediately comes to mind when you started talking about that was um, going back to that very beginning of our of our group, even before we called ourselves Grapple, and I was asked to lead this group. I um, I sat down and I worked really hard and I created the most beautiful twenty seven page <laughs> PowerPoint presentation on how we were going to solve racism at Memorial Drive United Methodist Church, and it was I mean it was airtight right? And I uh, came into contact with you and um, the rest of the team that we were going to work with. And, and um, I gave my, my little spiel and, and you were very kind to listen to it. And then you had just come back from a conference with Father War where a, a, a Christian uh, social psychologist, uh, public theologian named Christina Cleveland had spoken. And you said, why don't we read her book? And uh, her book is called um, "This Unity in Christ." Unity in Christ. Yeah, it left my mind <clears throat> for a second. And um, I did not want to read this book because I wanted to move forward with my plan. And uh, but I figured uh, part of being a good leader is letting people feel like they have a say, right? I'm just kidding. <laughs> <laughs> so I. Um, so I, so I said, okay, I'll read this book. And really reading that book uh, was a pivotal moment for me, uh, realizing how easy it is for me as a white person to come in and say, I have the solution and to uh, put it in a PowerPoint and to charge forward with a bunch of ideas that frankly have been tried and sure. fail spectacularly in the same ways in many different churches or many different communities for the same reasons because we aren't doing the deep heart work and, and I say that heart h-e-a-r-t sure, sure. of, of reckoning with ourselves and um, of, of believing in uh, this is sort of separate from what her book was but what I can come to is believing in God's power and in God's plan mm -hmm to move this conversation forward mm -hmm. and releasing my own control over it. Sure. All sure. I can do is scatter the seeds and some of them will grow and some of sure. them will not grow for a while, but then they'll take off and grow later and some of yes. them won't ever grow, but that's okay, you know? Correct, correct, correct. Um, and so that would be my transformation. Yeah, yeah no, that's, that's so impacting. And, and I've seen that, I've seen that, that flourishing in you in so many, so many ways. Um, you know, for me, just to, as an eyewitness, you know, working with, with, um, with, with the white community for such a long time, one of the resistance that I see uh, quite a bit is, is, let me rephrase this, the invitation to presence, the, of the gift of presence, is very difficult sometimes for the white community to just accept. 
They want to do, they want to save, they want to invest, they want to give money, they want to be in charge, they want to lead, they want to, they want to get commi committees together, they want to go into the neighborhood. They, and before doing, sometimes your presence is enough. And that's something that I've been encouraging, especially during this time of these headlines, whenever I have had an opportunity to speak to a white community is inviting them for their presence is enough because sometimes you need to learn the sort of the ambiance of this voice in this case the black community's voice before you can interact or you can not interact but you can say anything or intervene or what have you and so that tells what you just said the the, the release of control the release of I'm in charge, I'm the voice, I know, I went to Northwest, all those things that kind of sometimes betray the ego, because <laughs> it fills in, hey, listen, you know, I, I know, you know, I know how to do this, because I've led corporations before, I've done this. So accomplishments tend to get the best of you versus sometimes I just need to sit down, I need to listen, I need to be led, which is something that's very difficult sometimes for my, for the white community. And when I've seen that happen, I've seen transformation. And, and when I say this, I, I, I say it with all due respect, because I don't know everything. Uh, but I think that's the key of genuine transformation and genuine connection. Not me running and hitting the, the emergency button. Okay, we gotta get, in, we gotta get into a, a black neighborhood and we gotta do these things to fix what, what their problem is. No, uh, or, we got to get connected to, to a black church and do an event together. So that way they'll, know you, they'll see unity. All those things are great intentions, but I think there needs to be some work before that gets done. And so, so that's why I wanted to hear a bit of your example, because I know that you've had a trajectory of seeing these things and, that, and then now you're so involved in it so much that it is easy. You would agree, right? For you to be led, for you to listen, for you to, be, you know, just your presence is enough. Uh, you know, what do you think about that? I mean, is that what? Well, I just to clarify that it, is it easy? Um, it is becoming more natural because mm. it is something that I have cultivated. But sure. I still recognize in myself the impulse to say, um, for example, I am on the board of the Convict Leasing and Labor Project, um, which has been working to properly memorialize the Sugarland 95, and. Um, our late founder, Reginald Moore, he's recently passed away, but he had um, a very different way of looking at the world than I did and of strategizing how we were gonna do this project. Sure. And it wasn't always easy for me at sure. all sure. To, to say, because I felt like I know what to do to get a, you know, to get a, a government agency to do what I want them to do. Sure. Sure. Um, but sometimes, the expediency, if you, if you follow the expediency, you lose the beauty of the whole sure. process and the transformation is what is, is, even if you don't get the end result that you first imagined, you get the transformation that comes along the way is sure. much more valuable. Yeah, yeah, no, and I appreciate that so much that you say that. That's so valuable. You know, um, I've been through a couple of mission trips in Central America and seen some of my sisters and brothers have a hard time with what you just described. And, um, and for me, you know, I've, I've tried to gently remind them, look, um, let the locals do what they do. Uh, you know, just because we do it in a certain way in the United States, that doesn't necessarily mean it works that way here. Um, let's allow them to, to lead us into where they're taking us. And you're so right. The end result may not be what's expected according to, to the sort of the the way we've been taught here in the, in the United States that we, we know the answer, right? Or we know how it's done. Uh, but you're right. When they allow themselves to go through the adventure or go through the process of the journey with the local people that we visited, oh my gosh, I've just seen some wonderful, joyful tears. And, um, and then, you know, when we get back and, and, and debrief on, on the experience, you hear a lot of, I never expected, I didn't know. Um, when I allowed myself, oh, when you hear these things and you hear what God really genuinely did, it's no longer I just checked off the box and I have a nice little picture of the, of the mission trip I've been a part of. There was an actual connection there, transformation and change. And, and, and when I've seen that, I, I just celebrate that because that's what it's about. But it is, you're right, it is when we allow ourselves to gently surrender to the space and then allow ourselves to surrender to the space where 
we're being led in. And, and so anyways, it's, it's such a impacting um, experience to allow yourself to do that. Um, well, Liz, uh, this has been so, so much fun. Uh, thank you again for the education piece you're bringing to the, to, the, to the table. I think it's so useful. I think you were guiding, you're guiding a lot of people. You're guiding me definitely um, on how to explain this, this education piece and how important it is. Um, uh, and so I, I wanna thank you for that. Any, any closing thoughts on your, uh, on your side? No, I'm just so um, so glad for the opportunity to share this way, and I do hope that people will send us questions. Um, we are happy to answer them. We're gonna we're gonna take on a question in the next series um, that that looks at race and ethnicity mm -hmm. um, and the difference there, and that that pulls into what are we talking about when we even say the word whiteness. Um, and so I'm Correct. excited about that and. Good. We really want to answer your questions and make yes. uh, make this space useful to you. Correct. The other thing that I want to encourage everyone that's listening to us, we don't have all the answers. We are doing this work ourselves uh, in, as individuals. This is a journey. Um, so I just want to invite you to lean in towards the work that or the material that's being presented and what's calling you and, and then kind of chew on that piece. Try not to find a definite answer because none of us have it. I think all of us are leaning towards God's voice and if anything, that's leading us towards this and, um, and then trusting that he's gonna continue to reveal and continue to show us and continue to uh, mature us in, in, in finding ways to genuinely unify with each other. Uh, and so I just wanna encourage people to know that. Uh, Liz, thank you so much again for, for everything you're bringing to the table. It's so useful, so meaningful. Um, and it's just so much fun doing this with you. I agree. Uh, I'm going to leave us with the prayer of St. Francis. Lord, make me into an instrument of your peace. Where there is hatred, let me sow love. Where there is injury, pardon. Where there is doubt, faith. Where there is despair, hope. Where there is darkness, light. And where there is sadness, joy. O oh, Divine Master, grant that I may not so much seek to be consoled as to console, to be understood as to understand, to be loved as to love, for it is giving that we receive. It is in pardoning that we are pardoned, and it is in dying that we are born to eternal life. Amen. Thank you again, Liz. I'll see you next week, yes. and uh, we'll talk to you soon. Okay, thank you. Take care. We are so glad you joined us for this week's conversation. You're invited to leave any comments or questions in the comments below. I want to leave you with these encouraging words from Jesus from the Sermon of the Mount. Blessed are the peacemakers, for they shall be called the children of God. We'll see you next time.